Alan Binney has said, Hey Tick, keep up the excellent clips. Question, how close did the Soviet Union come to collapsing in 1942? I'm thinking more about the civilian population here, as I recall hearing of widespread food shortages due to the need to keep the armies at the front supplied. Any comments? Okay, first things first, if you haven't seen, I believe it's the second episode of Battlestorm Stalingrad, now's the chance to go and watch it because I actually mentioned this during that episode. I, this question was asked before that and I haven't got time, I haven't had time to answer it, but I actually did a lot on the, how the 62nd Army and the 64th Army and so on were hungry, how cats and dogs were disappearing off the streets in Moscow. And most of this information came from uh, sources on Lend-Lease, but also a great book, uh, The Taste of War by Collingham, which I'll be referring to again in this episode. But I'm also going to be looking at primarily uh, The Econ Economics of World War II by Harrison, which also goes into a lot of detail as well. So I think this question, you know, how close did the Soviet Union come to collapsing in World War II or 1942? This is going to be an ongoing thing because the more books I read, the more snippets of information I'm getting. Because the problem at the minute is that it's impossible to actually calculate what the Soviet economy was. Um, and I'll get to that. So it's pretty hard to tell, okay, there were, you know, 2% from collapsing or something. There's no way to calculate it. And, and so we're relying on almost anecdotal evidence here. So what we need is a convergence of evidence. We need a a whole load of evidence to all be pointing in the same direction to be kind of going, yeah, there's something to this. And that seems to be developing now. Cats and dogs going missing in Moscow. Uh, people complaining that, oh, the food is bad at home, so we're going to actually go to the front. Oh, the food is bad at the front, we thought it would be better. Actually, it's not. Um, 62nd Army and 64th Army, 63rd Army, all running out of food, so on and so forth. All this is a kind of building up towards this idea that 1942, 1943, the Soviet Union is in dire straits. So this is all building up. The other one as well, where people were complaining that, oh, I mentioned this and, oh, Tick's clearly biased to blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, because we have a source that says it. Mo Molotov is talking to Roosevelt, I think it was 1942 or so, and, and Roosevelt says, look, we will reduce the amount of Lend-Lease we're sending you so that we can launch a second front in 1943 rather than 1944. Molotov turns around and says, no, 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 please, we actually need the food. We need this Lend-Lease, please keep, keep sending this, delay the second front. He actually says this. So it's like, hmm, uh, more evidence is kind of coming along. But as I said, we can't calculate the economy. So the problem with the Soviet Union is, and Harrison in his economics of World War II, even though he's not, I don't think he's fully grasped economics, but he even he makes this point that it's actually kind of impossible to calculate anything in the Soviet Union. And the reason why is because they are basically making it up, right? It's a centrally planned economy. They are making up the price of a tank, right? Oh, a C-34 costs 10,000 rubles or something. It's like, well, does it? It's like, there's no way to know because there's no free market and without the exchange of goods and services you don't have prices so there is prices on the goods but they're, they're meaningless right the gdp figures the gnp figures which harrison relies upon they're meaningless so this is why historians have kind of ignored the economics of world war ii because they can't actually calculate it but also it's why they've ignored the soviet union economy they know it's collapsing but they can't really measure why or how etc because all the manipulations in the economy prevent you from doing that. But what I'm going to try and do is give you a few, not anecdotal, but sort of, aha, this is kind of hinting in the same direction because it does, I am slowly coming to this opinion that the Soviet Union was close to collapsing. If not in 1942, then if, if the Germans had kept hold of the Caucasus in 1942, let's say Stalingrad had been won and they'd hold on to that area, if that had happened there's a good chance that the Soviet Union economically would have collapsed in 1943. That's how I'm looking at it now. There's no way to ever prove this probably, but it's it's something that it's like, ooh, this, this has actually got something to it. 
So let's start off with the pre-war economy because it will give us some hints as to why this might be the case. So we know about things like the Holodomor, we know things about the purges in the late 1930s and so on. We also know that in 1937 there was a census, the population was seen to be lower than what it actually should have been in certain areas. So Stalin had the people who did the census shot and then redid the census and made it out as if everything, everything was okay. Right, so there are manipulations in the economy. However, some statistics that Harrison gives are pretty interesting. So he says 57% of the Soviet working population, so the whole of the working population in the Soviet Union, 57% of them were agricultural workers and they were producing just 33% of the economic output of a non-agricultural worker. So to compare this, Germany had 26% of their population in agriculture, the USA had 27% and the, sorry, 17%, and the UK had 6%. So, uh, yeah, you can basically say, well, there's, they're more industrialized, but they are significantly more industrialized 57% of the Soviet population were in agriculture compared to, you know, the, the worst one there is Germany at 26%. It's like, wow, that's actually significant. So a lot of these guys are in agriculture and going off the statistics, they weren't as efficient in the Soviet Union as they were in these other countries. So they probably didn't have enough tractors. The collectivization obviously hasn't ha helped, but they were 33 as economically productive 33% as economically productive as a, a, a non-agricultural worker. In Germany, they were about half as productive. So again, that's due to the industrialization and, and like tractors and so on. The USA was 40% uh, as, as productive. And uh, the UK, for some reason, was 59%. I'm not sure why. But the point of the matter is that the Soviet Union has got more people in the, the agricultural sector and they're not, even though it's done that, they're not as efficient as any of these Western powers, which means, and I think Harrison comes to this sort of explanation, he actually says the low productivity meant that they couldn't extract too many workers from the farms, because if they did that, they would start starving. Well, what happens in, in 1942? The Ukraine, which is the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, is overrun by the Germans, then the Northern Caucasus, and you've got a bunch of people drafted into the army. Uh, and another one, which is going on about gulags, uh, talked about how the the, the population uh, changed from male to female because all the males were being drafted into the war. So the, the agricultural workers in the farms were all the females and all the men have gone to the war, which, I mean... It's hard to tell because it's. It, it, I don't have any specifics, but when they did this in Britain, when they did this in Germany, I believe, and the and the women took over, they, the women weren't used to doing it. So as a result, they weren't as efficient as the men. That's not to say that, this is not sexism, that's not to say they couldn't have learned. It's just that somebody who doesn't do the job is suddenly thrust into a new job. They're not going to be as good as somebody who's a veteran at the job. That's kind of, so with all these new people, who, oh, okay, I'm driving a tractor now. Obviously not as efficient as people who already were farmers, etc. So this happens as well. So it's a knock-on effect after knock-on effect of actually the agricultural sector in the Soviet Union is, is in dire straits. So according to another statistic, the amount of rubles spent on the economy dropped from 58.3 billion in 1940 to 31.6 billion in 1942. Now... There is, at the same time, inflation going on in the Soviet Union. So not only was it, oh, a drop of about half, it's also the inflationary impact would have impacted it as well. So it again, it's impossible to calculate, but it's more than half because of the inflation. So if you think, okay, let's say a good portion of that is on agriculture, you're going to have less than half of the money going into the... Which makes sense because they're spending it on the war, but the point is it's not like, oh, we kept it consistent. No, they dropped it down in order to focus on the war effort, which they did, to be fair, and made lots of tanks. But that's not good because the economy in, in terms of agriculture was already severe by this point, and you then have the overrunning of 
the Ukraine and the Caucasus and so on, so, so on and so forth. So these are all just little hints at sort of saying maybe there's something wrong here. So the, the Soviet Union currency, the ruble, went from uh, 23.9 billion rubles in 1940 in today's prices uh, circulating to 34.8 billion in 1942, 43.9 billion in 1943, so on. So this is again more statistics saying yes there is actually inflation going on which is just uh, this it's not good it's all it'll do is it'll flood into the capital goods industries so i mean that actually might help the agriculture to be fair but uh, we already know that they starve the peasants throughout the soviet union i'm going to emphasize that otherwise we'll have people crying in the comment section we know they did that. We know they, they centralized the farms so that, you know, they collectivized the farms. And the problem with that is that there's no, there's two problems. One, there's no incentive for the farmers to actually produce anything beyond the subsistence level. And then, which is why their productivity was probably lower. And then also because of the manipulations in the economy, there's no way to calculate prices. So there's no idea what to be produced. There's no way to calculate it. So they're just kind of producing whatever um rye bread which is yeah um so all these manipulations and whatever else and, the, and this collectivization doesn't help uh you've already half starved them so these people aren't very productive and he actually says that in one aspect of the low soviet development was a large low productivity agricultural sector this meant that millions of work, soviet workers had to be held back from military service and industrial war work they were retained in agriculture where their GNP contribution, um, gross national product, was a decreasing fraction of the contribution to the average industrial worker in order to supply the army and defense industry with agricultural products. And it's during the centralization, collectivization era that the centralized uh, uh, distribution system for food was set up, which as according to Collingham, basically collapses during the war. To, to quote from Collingham, uh, page 343, as Soviet citizens' average daily intake of calories between 1942 and 1943 is estimated to have been 2,555 calories. Uh, and then in 1944, this amount is thought to have increased to 2,810 calories uh, as the war changed. Uh, she says a little bit later, the Soviets survived on far less food than all other combatant nations except the Japanese. They consumed at least 500 calories less than the average British or German civilian, while Americans were, on average, consuming at least 1,000 more calories a day than, than a Soviet. Um, but, she says, the picture conveyed by averages fails to convey the unreliability of the food supply and periods of shortages and severe lack of food, the fact that food was distributed unequally across the population, so that while the communist elite might stuff themselves on stewed meat for breakfast, the dispossessed and hungry were reduced to licking the plates after others had finished their meal. Uh, a dependent or non-manual worker's ration of 200 to 400 grams of substandard bread, not rye bread, actually says substandard bread this time, meant that it uh, it took great ingenuity to scrape together enough to eat. And we've seen this as well in other books, uh, and I think I mentioned it in the Stalingrad video. Uh, some estimates put it where the Soviets are eating half as much food as a US soldier or civilian. So the, the US people are getting twice as much food as a Soviet soldier or um, civilian. I didn't really want to mention this, but I'll mention it now because I was kind of leaving it till the Stalingrad campaign. But uh, Chuikov is actually boasting that his men are surviving on 1000 calories a day um, during the Battle of Stalingrad. So it's like, you know, the, the amount of calories regardless of whether you you know it's hard to count calories i get it but the point is that on average these guys are not getting enough food and this is in 1942-43 some good uh, statistics here so uh 
Harrison makes the point, yeah, you definitely can't trust the official figures, um, but even if you do, there's some surprising results. So he says, just between 1940 and 1942, the real output of most civilian branches fell by one half to two thirds, while that of the military services more than doubled, and that of defense industry more than trebled. Okay. Um, and then he mentions these statistics as a percentage of their official 1937 level, which again, you can't really trust, but let's just go with it. By 1942, the agricultural output had reached 44%. 44% of the 1937 level. Right, and then uh, trade and catering had plummeted to 36%. And uh, the, the gross national product had declined to 79, 79%. So, again, this is not... I mean, again, you can't really trust the, the official statistics, but it's hint. I mean, do you think the Soviets wouldn't kind of boost that a little bit? I think they would, and they probably did. Um, but yeah, these statistics are basically pointing in the direction of something's going wrong here. When you've got less than 50% of the food from 1937 in 1942, you're not doing well. You're not doing well at all. He also points out that there's roughly 50 million people employed in agriculture in the Soviet Union in 1940, and by 1942, that figure had dropped to 25 million. So again, a half, you're seeing half of the uh, production level, you know, basically everything's cut in half. And so, you know, imagine just having half as much food as you would now. And that's the official figures, which again, I'm not, I don't trust. He does say there's a shifting from uh the the can I say the consumer economy to the defense industries and that is definitely true we see the production levels grow etc and that's fine and it, it's understandable um but it does seem like they squeezed the consumer really badly and that's what he's saying now he does say and this is a quote there remains no satisfactory overview of soviet living standards during world war ii which is what i said before a few stylized facts may be presented. For the mass of the people, wartime consumption was limited to the struggle for housing, heating, basic clothing, and food. Food supplies were the critical factor determining survival, and during most of the war, there was not enough food to go around. Half the population, mainly soldiers and public sector employees, were covered by the official rationing system and then he goes on uh he says that most important commodity was bread which supplied 80 to 90 percent of the rations etc now but yeah the point was half the population was on the official ration system well what happened to the other half okay um there's more evidence that in the gulags which okay fine they don't have great living standards anyway i know some people think they're holiday camps they're not um, but in the gulags, rationing was was decreased massively, and it, I, bl I forget the exact year. I think it's 1942-43. They're actually str they're actually um, starving, like really starving in the gulags to the point where the people are saying, "Hey, we're running out of workers. We we need more workers," and obviously they can't supply it. But the the gulags are actually starved. Okay, so this comes from labor camp socialism. And uh, it says, uh, in all, in all, during the war years, over five million prisoners passed through the gulag camps and colonies. Of these, about one million were released early and sent to the front. The overwhelming majority of those remaining in the gulag were ill, emancipated, and infirm. Many of them had survived purely by chance. Some have had been given light work. Others had encountered a good boss or humane doctor. There's evidence that even before the war, in 1939, the, in the gulags, there wasn't enough food. And uh, there's one quote saying there's a high mortality in the camps due to the fact that the provisions were not being provided in enough um, quantities. And this is in 1939. So you can imagine, okay, the food supplies were terrible then, what they're going to be like in 1941-42. This is a quote 
Camp mortality reached its peak in 1942 when an average of over 50,000 uh, prisoners died every month. <laughs> Flipping egg. In some camps, the death rate was substantially higher than in the Gulag as a whole. In one place I can't pronounce, S-E-V-U-R-A-L-L-A-G, Severalag, for example, in what the administration considered to be the worst of the camps, in 1942, 1,615 prisoners died in January alone. Um, so, we said before, 5 million people went through the camps, 1 million went to the army, and according to calculations made in this book over 2 million people died in the camps and colonies of the gulag during the war years so that's that's half of those remaining who hadn't been shifted to the army wow harrison says less is known about the living standards of the rural population collective farmers lived off the meager residual product of the collective farm and the product of the own sideline activities. Uh, anecdotal evidence suggests per uh, pervasive hardship and tends to confirm that World War II, in contrast to World War I, saw a loss of social privilege for food producers. The Soviet economy did not disintegrate, food producers did not retain food surpluses, and the burdens of the war were forcibly spread across the population, urban and rural alike. Um, he goes on, he actually mentions household consumption per worker decreased roughly two-fifths from 1940 to 1943. Uh, yeah, so again, all these all these things are just pointing at the fact that the, the Soviet Union, even behind the lines, isn't doing so well. And I'm just getting to that, you know, I'm getting to this conclusion. I think something was really catastrophic here we can't though suggest okay if the germans had really retained control 100 percent definitely the soviet union would have collapsed in 1943 you can't really say that but looking at this it's like i mean how how, how close were they to be another quote malnutrition was widespread and, and undoubtedly carried off many victims in the interior of the country not just in famous episodes like the siege of leningrad Poor dietary conditions were so conductive to the spread of diseases, were also conductive to the spread of diseases, and the incidence of typhus, typhoid fever, and tuberculosis rose sharply in 1942. Another 1942 one. Apparently in, in 1942, death rates in Siberia peaked, you know, Siberia right next to the front line, clearly not. Uh, quote, after 1942, death rates fell, not because conditions were improving, but because the most vulnerable members of society had already been carried off. <laughs> wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, again, no way to prove it. I just think that something desperate was happening in 1942. And if, if they hadn't a counter in 1943... Mm. And so this is where we get to the Lend-Lease argument. So it's like, oh, I know it's going to cause controversy. Soviet Union's in dire straits. I'm not saying Lend-Lease won the war. Not saying that. What I am saying, though, is that it might have actually helped enough to keep the Soviet Union in the war. Not in terms of tanks and all that, although they certainly helped. It's not about the tanks. It's not about the aircraft or whatever else, uh, necessarily. It's actually about the resources that the the United States and to some extent Britain are giving to the Soviet Union. Um, I did quote the amount of rations, etc. they were given to uh, the the Soviets from Lend-Lease. I believe, according to the books on Lend-Lease, that this could have kept a million people fed in the Soviet Union. Considering that the rations were halved, does that mean that 2 million people in the Soviet Union were kept alive through the power of Lend-Lease? I don't know, but you can imagine just, oh no, there's not enough food for 2 million extra people. How bad would the situation have been? So this is not a sort of, yeah, Lend-Lease, this is more of a, the Soviet Union was in dire straits. It was really in dire straits by 1942, 
And if the Germans had, or the Axis had kept hold of the Ukraine and the Caucasus, or the Northern Caucasus in 1942 to 3, which is what Hitler had hoped, could that have been the death now of the Soviet Union? Would the people have just had enough and rebelled and, or would, would it just, people would have just started dying in the streets, uh, which they may have been anyway. Um, I don't know. I, again, it's, it's it's an alternative to Thailand. No way to know. I mean, I'd love to hear what you guys think. But all this evidence is coming along, which is, is suggesting, yep, something was definitely wrong with the Soviet economy and so on. Because I've had people in the comments going, no, 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 Tick's making it up, blah, blah, blah. I've got like 20 sources now that are all saying the same thing. No, something's going wrong here. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not hearing bountiful quantities of food in 1942. Not hearing that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm really, I'm really coming to that conclusion. But I'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, I, I genuinely think 1943 would have been a very bad year had the Germans not been pushed back at Stalingrad. Uh, 